That said, uh, let me say that uh, we, we have always thought this is a very interesting and timely subject. And I think yesterday helped us uh, uh, confirm that belief. Um, some of you might have seen that the European Court of Human Rights heard the case brought, brought by elderly Swiss women challenging Switzerland's efforts to fight climate change. Uh, a little bit later in the day, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution requesting an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice, which will, uh, amongst other things, look at whether states are complying with their human rights obligations with respect to their efforts to address climate change. So we are here with a lot to talk about today. Uh, and that said, I'd like to get us to the conversation from our uh, wonderful panelists on this topic as quickly as possible. So I'll, I'll do introductions uh, unjustifiably briefly for each of them, um, but you have access to their profiles. Um, Professor Marie Claire Cordonier Seger is a visiting uh, Chair in Sustainable Development Law at the University of Cambridge and a Professor of International Law at the University of Victoria in Canada. She is very widely published on the topic of sustainable de development law um, generally. Uh, we have also Samuel Wordsworth KC. Sam is a leading specialist in public international law and in international arbitration. He fre frequently acts for states before international tribunals, including the International Court of Justice. Some of his cases include uh, some of that are most relevant to the issues we're discussing, uh, the Mox Plant case, uh, the Kishinganga case, the Salala River case, the Road case, coastal states right case. I'm going through those too quickly. Um, but as I said, uh, you can read more about them in the, in the materials. Uh, we also have Maria Victoria Gama. She is a, human, a senior human rights analyst at Verisk Maplecroft. She has a background in human rights. And in her current role, uh, advises companies on identifying and addressing human rights risks relevant to their operations. So it brings a very interesting uh, perspective to dis today's discussion. Now, I, I think uh, some of you uh, know a lot about this topic already. Uh, I think probably some additional background would be helpful. Uh, I'm not going to do that. We found someone a little bit more qualified uh, to provide that background on the right to a healthy environment, and that is Professor David Boyd of the University of British Columbia. He wasn't able to join us today, um, but he has prepared some comments um, that we'll show in a moment. He was, as some of you know, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment and was uh, absolutely instrumental in having the right to a healthy environment recognized as a human right. So l let us uh, now have him give us that background. Hello, I'm Dr. David Boyd, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. Delighted to be joining you for this event on the right to a healthy environment and transnational dispute resolution. As you all know, in October of 2021, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a resolution recognizing the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And that was followed in July of 2022 by a similar resolution from the General Assembly. These resolutions mark a landmark in the recognition of the right to a healthy environment, but this is not a new right. It has been since the 1970s included in more than 100 constitutions, more than 100 environmental laws, and parties to, um, there are more than 130 parties to regional agreements that recognize this human right. So in total, 156 of the UN's 193 member states recognize in law the right to a healthy environment. And there's a bill in Canada that will boost that number to 157 in the coming months. The right to a healthy environment at the domestic level has already proven to be a catalyst for changes in environmental legislation to make those laws and policies stronger, to improve the implementation and enforcement of those laws and policies, to put a focus on populations that may be particularly vulnerable to climate and environmental harm. And so we have a good understanding of what the right to a healthy environment means based on these decades of experience at the national and regional levels. It's quite appropriate that I'm recording this video on March 29th, a uh, historic day for the pursuit of climate justice. The United Nations General Assembly has adopted by consensus a resolution 
requesting an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on state obligations related to climate change. And that resolution specifically refers to both of those UN resolutions on the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. As well, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights has heard its first two cases on climate change and human rights today. And the Grand Chamber specifically asked parties about the implications of the UN recognition of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment for its decisions. So this right in a very short period of time has gained unprecedented global prominence. It's being mainstreamed in all kinds of places. Uh, for example, it was included in the outcome document from Sharm El Sheikh at the climate conference COP27 last year. It was at the heart of unprecedented uh, changes in the way we attempt to protect, conserve and restore biodiversity through the uh, inclusion of this right in particular, but more broadly, a human rights based approach in the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. It's currently included in the draft of the new Global Treaty on Business and Human Rights, and parties are pushing for its inclusion in the Plastic Pollution Treaty that's under negotiation and the Pandemic Prevention Preparedness and Response Treaty that's under negotiation. The right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment can be used as both a shield to defend government action and a sword to attack government action. For example, France successfully defended laws restricting hydraulic fracturing for fossil fuels and prohibiting the export of pesticides not approved for use in the European Union, in part by referring to the constitutional right to a healthy environment, uh, which was recognized in France in 2004, and also the government's obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill this right. Similarly, Costa Rica used the right to a healthy environment as a key element of its defense in cases challenging a ban on offshore oil and gas development and a ban on open pit metal mining. Costa Rica su succeeded in both domestic litigation at its constitutional court and in cases brought pursuant to international investment and trade treaties through international arbitration. On the other hand, civil society, indigenous peoples and communities have used the right to a healthy environment as a sword to challenge inadequate climate action, the failure to improve air and water quality, the creation of sacrifice zones where intense pollution is permitted by placing investors interests ahead of human health, human rights and the environment, the failure to protect and conserve biodiversity and the failure to limit the environmental impacts of industrial agriculture. When these cases fail in domestic courts, they are increasingly being brought to regional human rights courts and tribunals representing sorry, resulting in an unprecedented convergence of environmental law and human rights law. For example, we are waiting for a landmark decision from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in a case called Community of La Arroya versus Peru, uh, a case in which the court will apply the right to a healthy environment in the context of industrial air pollution and toxic substances. Uh, and also we have the uh, trio of cases that are before the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights on climate change and human rights that I mentioned earlier. The final point I'd like to make in this brief video is that the recognition of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment also really highlights the fact that we have built a global economy based on the exploitation of both people and nature. And in the face of an unprecedented global environmental crisis, the right to a healthy environment highlights that business as usual is incompatible with the full enjoyment of this human right. And to give this uh, a specific uh, example in the context of transnational dispute resolution, I believe that the right to a healthy environment will not only be used by states in defending themselves in the context of investor claims made pursuant to investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, but will also contribute and is contributing to undermining public confidence and support for those trade and investment treaties, and in particular, the dispute settlement mechanisms, because of the complete failure to recognize the state's abilities to protect human rights, to take action, to protect the climate and protect the environment. And so these UN resolutions, while they may seem abstract, are having already within a short period of time, global implications both at the domestic level 
and also at the international level. I look forward to hearing the outcomes of your conversation today, and uh, I wish you a, a productive and thought-provoking event. Thank you very much. And thank you to David. I think that's a very helpful and enthusiastic introduction to the topic. And uh, on that note, I'll uh, turn to our panelists, starting with Marie Claire. One of my colleagues' PowerPoints is up in front of us. It's going to be wonderful. Marvelous. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I see John Knox, professor, who has also held an incredibly important role in promoting the right to a healthy clean, sustainable environment, and also my valued mentor, Sir Chris Greenwood, among other leaders in our group. And I can't think of a better uh, set of minds to be joining us today to think about these important issues. We live in a complex and globalized economy, one that is linked by a web of national authorities, world trade organization, UNCTRAL, ICSID, and other rules and also an increasingly fragmented and proliferate network of regional and bilateral economic accords. 340 plus regional trade agreements, 548 more, um, over 2,290 bilateral investment treaties, and at least 324 trade investment accords linking the global economy. The map shows marine traffic density, which I think is just one useful indication. At the same time, we face rising global social and ecological risks, a series of shocks to our world economy, including the pandemic itself, of course, and science warning of intensifying human development pressures, shattering of planetary boundaries. It's a fragile economy to try to help solve some of these problems. And the global challenges that we face, which David referred to briefly in his video, include climate change with existential risks, 37% of global populations suffering heat waves and extreme impacts, devastating droughts, floods, and forest wildfires, which will rise exponentially if current projections are kept on course. And again, if you look at the maps and think about where your country is and where your community is, this is a very sobering set of risks to be facing. Human rights are at stake, and so are millions of other species of non-humans. At the same time, and, and, and directly relevant to those species, we face loss of biodiversity and ecosystems that the human population depends on, with over a million animal and plant species threatened with extinction within only a few years. And our oceans are degrading, our fresh water resources are degrading, affecting the lives and human rights of many more. In that context, concerns have been raised that trade and investment flows can exacerbate rights violations and environmental degradation. Trade is said to embody 17 to 30 percent of biodiversity loss, um, up to 38 percent of global problematic labor, um, and between 23 and 30 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. The international responses to these complex challenges and impacts, these global wicked problems, are increasing in severity and impact, but the risks are not actually surprises. For over three quarters of a century, since the UN has existed and even before, we've been struggling to find solutions to these problems. And of course, as David just mentioned, in July 2022, the UN Global General Assembly recognized the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right that is related to other rights and existing international law. It remains to be seen whether recognition of this right will significantly change how environmental sustainability considerations are addressed in transnational dispute resolution. And that is, of course, the focus of our conversation here. The global policy agenda on that sustainable aspect 
of the human rights is especially explained to us through the 17 Sustainable Development Goals also adopted by the UN, and the 169 targets measurable with indicators that set up a framework to facilitate international cooperation and action. It's not my focus here, but there are hundreds of treaties that help to deliver on these different sustainable development goals, and there's binding law that we can query and assist in implementation and compliance. At the same time, international and transnational dispute settlement across many courts and tribunals is directly relevant to many of these goals and to the increasingly recognized right that is at our focus today. Not just state to state with advisory opinions such as the one that was determined yesterday um, to be requested of the ICJ on climate justice with the South Pacific students, but also, of course, um, there we've seen in the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea a further advisory opinion coming forward, and the World Trade Organization and our free trade agreements. There are also state to other disputes that are perhaps, and I will nod especially to my mentor here, even more relevant. If you have a human rights concern, you should be looking at human rights tribunals as a good place to bring it. And it's very important to take into account that that structure of international law exists with special understandings of these rights in those courts. And we see some of those cases and advisory opinion requests going forward even now. David is involved in the one for the Inter-American Human Rights Court, for example. So just as a way of definitely recognizing that this international and transnational disputes universe is much broader than investment law or trade law, I would call our attention to some of the significant ICJ decisions, ITLO's cases, as well as the relevant WTO cases, where environmental concerns and this right to a sustainable environment have not been raised by the parties but have been at consideration as the subject matter of the dispute. And of course, what we've seen is a hesitance, and I will get to that, to raise human rights issues at all in the World Trade Organization, perhaps understandably. There are also bilateral and regional trade tribunals, regional human rights cases, and of course, investment disputes, which my colleague will discuss further. The guidance we've been given for the sustainable aspect of that right is guidance that would not surprise us. In the SDGs, we are meant to promote a universal rules-based, open, non-discriminatory, and equitable trading system under the WTO. It's meant to contribute to sustainable development. And in taking that into account, we can look at the assessments that have been carried out by states identifying both material and normative impacts of trade investment agreements prior to the treaties being agreed or updated. And we can identify especially three main tensions in the weight of assessments that have been done, impact assessments on human rights, environment, sustainability impact assessments. Attention one, which is that obligations can constrain the adoption and implementation of new regulations to meet other international treaty commitments on sustainable development, and I would pause it also to deliver on the more recognized human right of, that is the subject of our tribunal today. Tension two, pre-existing social and environmental challenges that can directly or indirectly be exacerbated by growing trade investment flows occasioned by the treaty. And tension three, actually incentivizing economic growth of an unsustainable nature, as David mentioned. And so then the question becomes, how are our structures of trade dispute settlement and trade decision making changing in order to try to take into account some of those tensions that have been identified in the assessments as well as the concerns in the academic literature by the civil society organizations, by our UN Human Rights Rapporteur and others. We have seen, of course, sustainable development recognized as an objective of the WTO. And the shrimp panel case, for example, has shown us that there are ways that it can influence and be taken into account by the WTO appellate body and panel. But trade investment law governs different scales and scopes, and the devil is in the details. It remains open in the WTO what specific provisions and measures can be enacted to actually ensure that there is a better fit and a better respect for the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment 
dispute settlement experiences to date reveal limited scope for WTO members to bring human rights-based arguments at all. And the members themselves do not choose, for example, in the AC asbestos case between asbestos and its substitutes, was it really a like product, if it's carcinogen or not, they didn't use the right to health to make their argument. They've been hesitant in the Brazil retreaded tires case, even in the US clove cigarettes case, when the right to health could have been played. In the EC Seals case, a little more recently, we did see indigenous rights come up, but as part of a finding of fact. And I'll come to a, 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 a sort of final point here, which is that we don't just need to look at the global level if we even just look at the treaty text as an indicator of some of the tri trade tribunal findings that remain to be queried, we can see many regional trade and investment agreements that are actually testing diverse trade and economic innovations, trying to change their treaties to better coincide with and take into account the measures that can be taken to contribute to that sustainable and healthy and clean environment. This is just the beginnings of that research, and it maps uh, regional trade and investment agreements to the different sustainable development goals. You can find provisions in the treaties that actually directly refer to uh, poverty, hunger, health, gender equity, um, clean energy especially, as well as climate change, biodiversity, and oceans, which I mentioned at the beginning. So I'll conclude with this. We've seen some pathways now in our trade treaties, some experiments at the regional bilateral level, remaining to look carefully at the actual trade tribunal decisions that are coming out and whether these are in any way taken into account. We've seen exceptions for sustainability measures, Article 20 style, but others as well, interpretive statements under the NAFTA. We've seen environment and sustainable development cooperation mechanisms that run alongside or even are integrated into the treaties, some of which are subject to dispute settlement, some not. And we've seen trade and investment enhancement measures for sustainable goods and services. I think that's the most exciting area that deserves more research, actually, where we look at how the trade and, or investment treaty can promote more sustainable goods and services that other treaties are strongly, strongly encouraging and asking for renewable energy, for example, for solutions through those goods and services. We've also seen process innovations, and I'll just focus on one here in the interest of time. Trade and investment arbitration tribunals. Would they be able to look at the implications of a trade treaty for the right to a clean and healthy environment? It might be more more useful and more likely that they would if experts panels, fact-finding missions, consultations, receptivity to amicus curiae briefs, transparency and public participation for hearings, publication of awards, or also some of the new innovations of net zero or green arbitration codes and policies are being adopted in these structures. So I'll conclude with an invitation that we do start looking at how international economic law can respect the human right for a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. We do this through the arbitrations and advisory opinions and courts and tribunal disputes, not just the ones on the economy, but also the ones on human rights and also sort of the international law and international law of the sea, um, uh, uh, places where we can go to solve these disputes. We also look carefully, however, at the broader society. The law will not solve all of these problems for us, not even close. I would say we're actually still just moving from being part of the problem to hopefully being part of the solution. Awareness, education, career skills for our graduates, research and knowledge, especially in shaping trade and investment in sustainable industries, and independent advice to our international economic law and policy leaders is needed very, very urgently. I'm going to conclude with a quote from the book that I think resulted in my invitation to join you today. The rules that facilitate trade investment could defend the interests of Hermes, Greek god of commerce, and thieves. Or learn to draw inspiration from Athena, the goddess of justice, wisdom, and the crafts. Thank you. Thank you, Mar Thank you Mary Claire. And uh, that's it. Sam? Uh, thank you very much, Justin.
Um, Professor Cordonnier Seger just suggested that trade and investment treaties may be exciting. Well, that's a rather nice thought. Uh, um, it reminds me a bit of last night when I ordered a crab sandwich and the waitress said, awesome. And you think, well, maybe, <laughs> perhaps maybe not. Um, anyway, a first and obvious point, um, which is the jurisdiction of investment treaty tribunals is confined to investment disputes. And naturally, tribunals uh, have been very concerned to ensure uh, that they have remained within those confines. But given that so many ISDS cases concern the environment, um, there is some real scope for this human right gaining some purchase in this area. And there are various examples where ISDS tribunals have considered that they can allow some form of human rights law in ISDS cases. One thinks of CMS, Suez, Continental Casualty, Al Warak, Sawa, uh, Tulip, Abasa, and Trusalis, and I'm sure there are many more. Um, so against that backdrop, I want to touch on six potential entry points for the right to a healthy environment in the context of ISDS, although it's necessary to say a word first on applicable law. Um, if a given investment treaty has an applicable law clause that allows a tribunal to apply the host state's national laws and or international law, there may at least, in theory, be some scope for direct application of the right to the extent that it forms part of international law or part of the applicable domestic law. Otherwise, and I think rather more likely, the right may play a role in the application of the substantive provisions in a given investment treaty, as in the al Warak case, or in their interpretation, where account is taken, of course, of relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties under Article 31.3c. And Strabag and Poland is an example of that. Of course, there's an immediate question uh, as to whether the right to a healthy environment has customary status. And an ISDS tribunal would need to be persuaded of that in the same way as any other tribunal applying international law. And I think it would likely be an uphill struggle, at least at the moment, um, and all the more so when it comes to giving specific content to the right that we see in recognised in uh, last July's General Assembly resolution. And one thinks of the rigour applied by David Caron and his colleagues in the Glamis Gold case when they were looking at the question of giving specific content to the minimum standard of treatment as a matter of customary international law. Uh, the unanimous General Assembly resolution could be deployed as evidence of opinio juris of states, consistent, for example, with nuclear weapons and the Chagos advisory opinions. Although a considerable number of the speeches by delegates in the General Assembly in favour of the resolution described it as a political rather than a legal affirmation of the right to a healthy environment. But who knows what the court is going to be saying uh, when it comes to the forthcoming advisory opinion on climate change. And in fact, if anyone is interested, I'll be taking $10 bets uh, after the session that we'll see a reference in the opinion to an emerging rule of customary international law or something similar. And I'll be very interested indeed to see whether Judge Greenwood takes me up on that offer. Anyway, six potential entry points into the world of ISDS. Uh, and the first concerns potential claims by investors, what David Boyd just described as the sword. Um, and think of a case like Allard and Barbados, where a claimant who has invested in, e in an ecotourism site contends that the state has acted inconsistently with prior representations to protect the natural environment of the site, thus breaching the FET provision 
in the treaty. And of course, this is hugely fact dependent. And in Allard, the tribunal held that Barbados's statements could not be characterized as representations capable of creating legitimate expectations. But the General Assembly's recognition of a right to a healthy environment, in particular if uh, the host state in, in the case voted in favor uh, of that resolution, could assist the investor in establishing the existence of the legitimate expectation, potentially even in the absence of specific representations. Although, of course, the investor is going to have a more uphill task in that case. Likewise, the General Assembly's recognition of the right and the evidence of state conduct inconsistent with the right could assist in the formulation of a claim based on arbitrariness. Another possible claim, although undoubtedly all the more challenging, could arise where an investor saw its investment, say a beachside hotel complex, adversely impacted due to sea level rise or some other impact of climate change. Of course, this is going to encounter the familiar problems of causation, which we've seen in climate change cases. But as to the substantive protections in an investment treaty, one could see arguments under the FET standard based on an interpretation that takes into account the right to a healthy environment, or indeed by reference to the full protection and security standard, which is of course focused on physical protection. And an argument could be mounted as to a failure of due diligence by the host state if it's doing little or nothing to protect the environment or address climate change. Of course, this would all be extremely difficult, but perhaps we should be welcoming the potential exercise of compulsory jurisdiction on these all important issues, even if the forum is not an obvious or easy fit. The next potential entry point concerns jurisdiction. And whereas is very common in an investment treaty, there's a requirement that the investment must be made in accordance with or in compliance with laws of the host state, there's a potential requirement that this requirement would not, potential argument that this requirement would not be met whether there, there is domestic law implementing the right as a, to a healthy environment and the investment cuts across that right. Support for that could be found in a case like Cortec in Kenya, where the tribunal observed that the text and purpose of the BIT and the ICSID Convention are not consistent with holding host governments financially responsible for investments created in defiance of their laws, fundamental to protecting public interests such as the environment. Now, of course, that case concerned a failure to comply with Kenya's specific regulatory regime and the obligation to carry out an EIA. And given the approach of past tribunals to this particular issue, the success of the argument is very likely going to turn on the significance and the legal effects of the right to a healthy environment in the applicable domestic law. Third entry point, which is defending a claim, David Boyd's shield. Um, and that's a much more obvious entry point for the right as a tool in the defense of a host state's acts that have been taken in protection of the environment. And one thinks of the potential role that the right might have played in the RWE in Netherlands case. That's the ECT claim concerning a decision to phase out coal by the year 2030. And one thinks, of course, also of Vattenfall. Adoption of a measure with some reference to an international law right to a healthy environment would be a strong counter to an allegation of arbitrariness. Also, as recently emphasized by Federico Ortino, when addressing claims under the FET standard, cases like Saluka identify the need to weigh the claimant's reasonable and legitimate expectations on the one hand and the respondent's legitimate regulatory interest on the other. In undertaking that balancing exercise, a tribunal may be persuaded that the nascent right to a healthy environment justifies, 
or indeed requires states to take a different course of action when it comes to regulation of industries that have harmful impacts on the environment. As always, each case is going to turn on its particular facts, but as a general propos proposition, the General Assembly's recognition of the right to a healthy environment may have carved out a little more regulatory space for states to act in. And more broadly, the very fact of the General Assembly's resolution and the attention that it is accorded may play an important role in tempering an investor's legitimate expectations. That is, it's reasonable expectations. And support for that can be found in continental casualty and also the Abassa case where the tribunal held, and this is Paris 624, Respondent rightly recalls that the province had to guarantee the continuation of the water supply to millions of Argentines. The protection of this universal basic human right constitutes the framework within which the claimants should frame their expectations. Obviously a different right, but you see the way that the human right impacts on the potential scope of the investor's legitimate expectations. And similarly, with respect to expropriation claims, the existence of the right will likely feature and may assist in defences based on the exercise of police powers. And there's no shortage of examples where the right could have played a role. One thinks of Chemtura or Methanex, or more recently, the 2021 award in Eco Moro Minerals and Columbia where a majority held that Colombia's decision to prohibit mining activities in sensitive wetland was motivated by the importance of protecting the environment and hence there was a legitimate case of exercise of police powers. Now would the right have impacted on the decision in Rockhopper and Italy, assuming that it was accepted as having customary status? Of course one can say no, because the decisive factor for the tribunal was the positive EIA um, accorded to the project just four months before, before the change in the law banning offshore oil production. But it is rare that an award starts with what reads very like an apology, and one sees the discomfiture of the tribunal in the eventual outcome in the separate opinion of Pierre-Marie Dupuy. Now suppose the public outcry that followed the original approval of the project had been accompanied by an assertion by the public of a recognised human right to a healthy environment. Unless account had been taken of that right in the original approval process, a state would surely be able to revisit its approval such that a change in the law could be a valid exercise of police powers. And for the future, I would expect the recognition of the right to encourage tribunals to take more seriously the host state's environmental concerns, even if there is a degree of inconsistency to the state's acts as there was in the Rockhopper case. And to note, the right may indeed soon feature as part of the facts underlying a given ISDS dispute. For example, in Australia, the Queensland Land Court issued a landmark judgment in late 2002, recommending the refusal of an application to develop Australia's largest coal mine on the basis that it posed unacceptable climate change risks and unjustifiably impacted various human rights enshrined in the Queensland Human Rights Act. Although that act doesn't contain a right to a healthy environment, one can easily foresee cases where such a right is invoked in domestic law and where a foreign investor then seeks to challenge an executive or judicial decision made by reference to the right in an ISDS claim. A quick word on three further potential entry points. Depending on the wording, of course, of the given treaty, there may be scope for the right to feature as part of, or most likely in support of, a counterclaim by the host state. The sums awarded in favour of Ecuador in the Burlington case, um, and also in, 
favor of Ecuador in the Perenco case may be encouraging states to give serious consideration to the filing of environmental counterclaims. And the most straightforward cases will be those like Perenco and Burlington, where there is uh, an environmental law standard which is applicable through domestic law. This position is obviously going to be more challenging where a state seeks to argue, as in Urbasa, that the investor is under an obligation derived from international law. The right to a healthy environment, if it exists under international law, is most obviously the responsibility of states. The General Assembly resolution merely calls upon business enterprises to adopt policies to enhance international cooperation, strengthen capacity building, and continue to share good practice. But the Abassa case does suggest that there's a distinction when it comes to corporate responsibility between a right that requires positive steps, like the right to water, and human rights that are more the focus of a prohibition, and one may see the right to a healthy environment more in that latter category. Entry point five is compensation. There may be scope for the right to impact on the quantum of compensation as a part of broader environmental considerations. And I think of the Unglauber and Costa Rica case, where the tribunal considered the fair market value of the property by reference to its highest and best use, which it characterized as usage appropriate to the environmentally sensitive surroundings. Alternatively, the existence of the right might impact on the willingness of a tribunal to order DCF uh, damages, as in the Rockhopper case, or at least allow for the right to be factored in a, in a way when it comes to fixing the appropriate discount rate. And finally, the right may play a role where there is expressed treaty language giving weight to protection of the environment, such as in a preamble or in Article 1010 of the US Oman FTA, uh, which was at issue in Al Tamimi and Oman, which I think is one of Judge Brower's cases, um, or there may be express wording in a police powers provision in the treaty. And of course, we've seen in the uh, draft ECT provisions, um, specific environmental and climate change protections, should that draft ever see the light of day. A few very brief concluding words, if I may. Um, I think the right will undoubtedly feature in the arguments made before ISDS tribunals and may over time influence outcomes in a way that is beneficial to protection of the environment. I see a slight quizzical eyebrow being raised in the front row, but let's see. Um, but it could be said with some force that ISDS tribunals may not be the best fora for clarification of the scope and content of obligations pertaining to human rights and the environment. These subjects are evidently matters of concern to an audience much larger than a host state uh, and an investor who are locked into one particular legal dispute. And so much depends on the identity of the arbitrators, a point that was noted 10 years ago by Judge Simmer when he was looking at the potential impact of the right to water. Against that, there may also be an element of faute de mieux here. An investor that is truly adversely affected by a host state's inaction on environmental protection or climate change may have no access to any other international forum. And indications from investment treaty tribunals that they take the right seriously could be precisely the sort of benign catalyst that David Boyd had in mind when he said last year that the right is not a magic wand we can use to solve all our challenges, but rather a catalyst for better actions. Let us see. Um, I now hand over to Victoria Gama, who's going to be addressing further the issue of corporate responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Curtis, for the invitation. I will try to keep it 
as brief as possible because I believe Justin otherwise <laughs> will be a little bit anxious. So let's keep it going. Over the past 30 years or so, uh, companies have increasingly been targeted by transnational litigation in cases involving uh, environmental damage and linking it to a human rights violation. What I would like to do today is to share some evidence of what this trend has looked like so far and what are some of the implications that will come along if, of course, the right to a healthy environment pivots into many different directions, right? I'll just group the sort of key findings into four specific categories. One of this is we're likely, right, to see an increase in the success rate of plaintiffs bringing cases uh, on transnational litigation against multinational companies. There is going to be an increase in this kind of cases, but not necessarily on the jurisdiction, right? We're likely going to see the same number of states looking at these specific cases. And these cases will likely become much more complex, right? We're likely going to see a shift from direct harm to the right to life, to the right to personal integrity, or to the right to health. And in turn, likely, we're going to also see an expansion on the industries, right, that will be tackled by this specific um, violations. So if these changes actually materialize, I believe that in turn the incentives from companies will be to push forward more uh, robust, let's say, ESG standards and legislation and policies, obviously cascading later on into their supply chains as well. So as I've mentioned, I will try to split the presentation into sort of the current status of the situation and the implications of the recognition of the right to a healthy environment, tackling first on the expansive or not jurisdictions that we're seeing, uh, moving on to certain outcomes of those, of those specific cases, and lately tackling on the specific industry. So the ideas that I will share today are basically premised on the fact of a sort of a more moderate, let's say, approach to the right to a healthy environment, one that in which basically plaintiffs uh, are only going to be successfully arguing a violation on the right to health or the right to a healthy environment if they can have a link to environmental damage as opposed to more indirect links that were mentioned in the case of climate change, right? But uh, before I wrap up and just to spark the conversation, I'm going to present to you sort of a more let's say, um, I would say, sort of challenging view, right? Sort of a more expansive view of what uh, the right to a healthy environment could look like for companies in that case. So let's keep it going, right? So as we were saying, in the last 30 years or so, we've seen that victims of environmental damage caused by businesses in the third country have increasingly resorted to tribunals uh, in a company's home country, right, by arguing that said damage involved in any sort of way human rights violations, uh, bringing, of course, the private sector to the fore of a conversation between environmental damage and human rights. Human rights-based litigation has been expansive in the sense of including environmental damage in that, in that sense to man-made natural disasters, uh, waste management, water and soil pollution, obviously, right? And with less than, let's say, 10 years in the making, of course, uh, extraterritorial litigation against companies has also included uh, and the expansion over climate change, right? And then the difficulty in trying to prove this more indirect and, and weaker link to that. So the map that you're currently seeing basically uh, shows the number of judicial cases that were brought uh, before foreign courts for environmental damage or climate change failure in terms of commitments. And we have actually used a human rights-based approach uh, in the argumentation. So Mapercroft Research shows more or less 25 cases, the ones that you're seeing over there, spanning 11 jurisdictions. Uh, some of the key hubs that you might already be aware of include the UK, France, Germany, and, and the Netherlands. La I mean, basically linked to the fact that there's a likelihood that they'll succeed and receive access to justice as opposed to countries in the global north. For some time now, the UK has actually become the forum of choice of many of these plaintiffs and have been trying to test access to justice 
in this specific cases, right? One of them, and a the famous one, is Lungova versus Vedanta Resources, uh, a case that was filed in 2015 by 1000 Zambian, uh, alleging that oil pollution caused by a subsidiary of a mining company was actually uh, threatening their right to, to health. So the jurisdiction are held with are always uh, complex right, were passed with flying colors. Uh, basically, the Supreme Court decided that if the case was going to be discussed in Zambia, it was likely that uh, the court wouldn't have the resources or the technical knowledge to put forward. So regarding the merits, the Supreme Court decided in this case to use the concept of a duty of care um, and the company's public human rights commitments to preliminary rule that uh, a company could be held accountable for these human rights uh, commitments. The truth is, unfortunately, we can't actually get to the merits of the case because it was settled. Uh, but we're likely going to see some similar case, this time linked to oil and gas companies with the Opavi v. Shell that's scheduled for uh, trial, I believe, last, next year. So we're also seeing a fair number of cases in France as a result of the French Duty of Vigilance Act. Uh, under the law, basically, harmed individuals can bring civil lawsuits seeking damages resulting from a company's failure to comply with its vigilance plan. Based on this law, a group of NGOs have actually sued the French uh, supermarket chain Casino uh, for its involvement in the cattle industry in Brazil and Colombia. In these cases, the plaintiffs are actually alleging that the forestation in the Amazon is actually harming the biodiversity, it's contributing to an increase in carbon monoxide emissions and eventually impacting the right to health. So it's sort of aligned with the more expansive view that I was presenting at the very beginning. So other jurisdictions that you see on the map, and I'm going, not going to refer to them because of time, it's our Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, Italy, Taiwan, Canada, and South Korea. And lastly, of course, I need to mention the elephant in the room, which is the US. Uh, as you see, there are six cases, but these cases are either quite old and have been closed, or some of them uh, come after the Kyobel versus Royal Dutch petroleum decision of the US Supreme Court. I'm not going to tackle on that because I know that we have an amazing panel uh, tomorrow looking at this. So as you can see, even though the fair number of cases have been brought forward, we only have a decision on the merits on less than 20% of those. Part of this has to do with the fact that a great number of these cases, as I mentioned, have been settled. And the rest, almost 40% of those, involves recently, recent cases that are still ongoing. But in the two cases that courts have sided with communities or with companies in this case, um, they have actually understood that there was no sufficient evidence uh, to determine the responsibility and the link between human rights and environmental damage. So that proves the difficulties, right, in, in actually coming up with evidence on, on that lens. And even in those cases that judges have sided with plaintiffs, uh, these have not rested on, on human rights claims. In those, courts have actually been reluctant to accept human rights arguments in the face of a duty of care for environmental damage. And one of those is Agpan versus Shell uh, in the Netherlands, right? In this case, they the court understood that the tort of negligence could not be characterized as a human rights violation hitting right in the face of the UN guiding principles on, on business and human rights, and again, proving the difficulties of actually proving the link. However, it seems that most of these the new cases, there's an upward trend of trying to join environmental damage with human rights, so it's likely that we'll see new developments in, in the coming years. Just a brief note on the industries, no wonder why we're talking about uh, these cases involving mining, in the, in, the, well, in the second case, and oil and gas as well, right? Because of the high impact of these industries and because normally it's easier to, to prove the link on, on that end. So now let's just try to focus on what the recognition of the right to a healthy environment without to transnational litigation. Um, understanding where actually environmental and climate change harms affect populations the most and which location cases of this kind are most likely to appear offers a window right, of opportunity into how transnational 
litigation will develop for companies. To do this, what we've done is we've mapped our climate litigation index, which basically comprises 198 countries on the risk of lawsuits being filed against corporations in relation to climate change against our healthy environment index, one that comprises data on air quality, biodiversity, CO2 emissions, climate change exposure, deforestation, food security, water pollution, and waste, uh, actually has hazardous waste. So when we take a look at the graph over there, you see that the jurisdictions with sort of a lower healthy environment risk, mainly UK, Australia, France, Germany, and the United States and Canada, uh, basically entertain the bulk of climate litigation cases, uh, whereas countries with worse track on environmental performance have fewer cases. What is, of course, not explicit there is that they are likely basically seeing transnational litigation flowing from the latter to the former, right? As we've seen and discussed, this is a question of access to justice, but at the same time is also a question of bringing these claims to the fore and center and focus of where headquarters are located. Of course, raising you know, publicity over these cases and at the same time, creating reputational harms for, for companies and actually in some ways sort of um, for investors as well, right? Driving away investors uh, for, for these developments. So the right to a healthy environment will become even more significant in jurisdictions where this right has already been previously recognized in the country's constitutions, um, where, I'm sorry, where it actually has not been right, um, incorporated in the constitution. So we're talking about the US, um, Australia, Canada, and, and the UK. So in a way, adding pressure, right, for its recognition. And if that is the case, it will be incorporated into law, bolstering plaintiffs' arguments, and we're likely going to see sort of more successful results for, for plaintiffs. Some of the countries that are represented on the visual belong to the global south. And this is so because the Climate Litigation Index actually does not distinguish between domestic and transnational litigation. But I believe it is worth mentioning some of these uh, because it is likely, and actually, if I were litigating these kind of cases, I would draw on some of the arguments brought in the global uh, south, right? So you see countries such as India and Philippines in which they have basically established track record on judicial activism in public interest uh, environmental cases, having spinning out their constitution, or at least the constitutional clauses on the right to environment. Same with some Latin American countries, including Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, and Argentina, more aligned with uh, an understanding of economic, social, and cultural rights. So in terms of jurisdiction, as I mentioned, I don't believe that we're going to see an expansive number of, of new jurisdictions, but I do believe that we're going to see an increase in the number of these cases. In terms of outcomes, I'll see that once these cases reach the trial phase, uh, the right to a healthy environment will assist claimants in building sort of a more straightforward arguments and sort of more convincing arguments before judges, right? You don't have to prove that there is a right, uh, a violation to the right to health, to the right of life, Instead, you just go ahead and prove that the right to your healthy environment has been affected. Um, lastly, while we, we've discussed a bit um, the fact that normally the, the sectors that are actually target include, of course, high emissions, uh, right, would have intrinsic operational risk and with the potential, of course, to cause uh, significant industrial damage, but the truth is if we go for, or at least try to understand for a more of a, an expansive view of the right to a healthy environment, it is likely that we're also going to see other sectors in the mix, right? Uh, basically because the focus will be sort of moved away from oil spills that directly impact a community, uh, to cases about greenhouse gas emissions, loss of biodiversity, or declining services provided by ecosystems, expanding right to other sectors, mainly manufacturing, agriculture, and chemicals production. As I mentioned at the beginning, I have so far discussed implications for business and transnational litigation on what I would characterize as a moderate approach. On the contrary, sort of a more radical view would expand on the idea that the right to a healthy environment is more expansive, and this means it entails the right of any person, 
across the globe to an environment that is not affected by climate change or the loss of biodiversity. So this interpretation would basically mean that any person would enjoy standing to bring claims for an infringement of the right to a healthy environment. So uh, let's say a citizen is just a UN, um, or you, basically a, a citizen from the EU is watching TV and comes to find out about Vaca Muerta in Argentina and the high number of CO2 emissions that that project would entail and feels that it's actually, I mean, his personal right to a healthy environment is threatened. So I know that this might sound a little bit far-fetched to some point, but arguments premised on, on this idea to some extent have already been part of the political discourse uh, of many countries involving even trade negotiations. And the case that I mentioned on casino is along those lines. So this, if this more radical interpretation gets accepted by course, I believe all bets are off regarding how transnational litigation will actually change because of the right to a healthy environment. Companies could be exposed to an indeterminate liability, uh, which could threaten the viability of projects and countries might actually face economic and development challenges as persons' rights in the world bring cases involving projects in, in their territory. But let's not thread on this. I'll love to talk a little bit more about this uh, on our conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you all for covering uh, these issues uh, in such an interesting way. As I said, there's a lot to talk about. It's hard to squeeze it all into 60 minutes. So I apologize to the audience for not having time for questions, but we've gone over a little bit. I'm sure some of us would be happy to stick around and talk over the coffee break, but uh, we, we do have to transition. Uh, I think we have Sir Christopher's lecture coming up at 10.30. Um, and we're, we're under rather strict instructions to not go more than a, a couple minutes past the allotted session time. So thank you again.